Well, this is uh, week number two of a brand new sermon series we kicked off last week. Somebody was, well, it was actually Mike Guzman that was joking with me before the first service. He said, you know, you could have done this whole sermon series with kind of a country flair. You know, and instead of us having a series called One Anothering, he said, you could have called it One Anothering, <laughs> One Anothering. And, you know, I'm like, well, maybe next time we'll do that. I don't know. I thought it was funnier than that. Y'all didn't think it was very funny. But <laughs> anyway, anyway, swing and a miss. This is week number two. Thank you, Andrew. I haven't heard that one in a long time. Uh, yeah. And so just in case you didn't, uh, weren't able to be here last week to hear me explain, what are you talking about one anothering? In the New Testament, mostly from Jesus, but also from some of the disciples, you will see over 50 times what, what I would call the one another commands. An example would be be kind to one another, pray for one another, <clears throat> bear with one another, teach and admonish one another. And so we started the sermon series uh, last Sunday with, with a biggie, love one another. And then for week number two, uh, we're, not, we're not backing off for Labor Day weekend Today I want to talk to you about what the Bible says that we are commanded to do, and that is to forgive one another. Uh, now, so this summer, uh, most of you remember, we went through the whole book of Colossians, and when we got to Colossians chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, <clears throat> a couple of the verses we read are our foundational content for this whole series. So let me just start there, look at this text with me, if you would, to be reminded of here it is again, another place where these one and others come from. Therefore, as God's chosen ones who are holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Look, there's one of them bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against another. And then look at the last part of that text. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Now, before we jump into this, let me kind of give you a, a working definition of, of what forgiveness is really all about, what it means. Um, to forgive means that you are willing to release a person from a debt or an obligation that has been incurred. Think of it like that. To forgive someone, it means you are making the choice to release them from the wrong they committed against you. <clears throat> now, let me say this. Forgiveness does not mean you are approving of their behavior it does not mean you're excusing what has played out. It does not mean you are trying to justify the injustice they might have committed against you. It does not mean you're supposed to walk around pretending like you were not ever hurt. But it is releasing by a choice on your behalf someone from this obligation that they have done against you because of the wrong that they did against you. Now, let's just be real. I, I don't know where you're at on this Sunday morning, but I, I think we all would agree that at some point in your life journey, uh, you, you've been on one side or the other side of this. We, we've all been on both sides of it. There are times where we are the ones who need to do the forgiving. Amen? Amen. And then, of course, there are times... When we need to receive, we need to be forgiven. So think about this with me. If, if you are the person who has been offended by someone else, if you're the one who has been hurt, you, according to the Bible, you're going to have to be willing to release that person who has wronged you. Granted, you, you may not want to hang out with them you, you may not be able to continue to be close friends. You may not be able to be business associates, although the goal would be that you might be able to work in that direction, work through all of that. But I want you to understand, 
that may happen and that may not happen, okay? So, so I, it is so very important for us to get a grip on understanding what this is all about. You can forgive someone, hear me out, you can forgive someone even when reconciliation has not yet happened, okay? I think forgiveness and reconciliation, in fact, don't normally all happen at the same time. Probably the very easiest example that most of you will get is like in a marriage. Marriages all the time, men get sideways. And when the relationship gets sideways, the spouse who has been offended with a very genuine heart can say to the other, I forgive you. They can say that with a genuine heart. But to reconcile in that marriage relationship, that is normally a process. It's a journey where the offender must be willing to put in the hard work so that there might be trust reestablished and loyalty reestablished and, and unity reestablished in that marriage. Now, there are there's so many ways to look at forgiveness. I would say for today, I want to talk to you about two different ways that forgiveness works. Forgiveness can be unilateral or forgiveness can be transactional. And I want to explain to you what I'm talking about when I, when I describe it this way. Uh, first off, if you break down the word uni, unilateral, you'll know that th this has to do with one, one, one way of forgiveness. And this would be the example. This is where you are willing to forgive someone who has never even asked you to forgive them for the actions against you that they committed. You're the one willing to forgive another person who has never asked you to forgive them for their actions against you. Now, let me, let me say this. There are a whole lot of people in our world today, my guess is even many of us here in the worship service now, who are being held hostage, hear me out, because they are waiting and waiting and waiting for someone, hopefully, to one day say to them, I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? And I want you to think about this with me. I want you to understand, if that person never, ever says, I'm sorry, and you decide not to forgive them, you potentially are being held hostage by what that other person may never, ever do. Think about that. In the book of Acts, chapter 7, we see Stephen, the first Christian martyr. As he was being dragged out of the city, he's then being stoned to death by a group of people who were absolutely enraged because of his bold faith. And he says right there in that text, he says, Lord, he cries out to the Lord, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Think about it. He's saying in that moment, while he's actually being stoned to death, he's saying, God, would you forgive them? And I'm going to tell you something about that group of people. That group of people, they literally murdered Stephen and not a single one of them were seeking to be forgiven for their actions. So this is the example of unilateral forgiveness. This is how it works. You, you, you move into the space where you're actually willing to forgive someone who has never ever asked you to forgive them for their actions against you. Now let me say this. Unilateral forgiveness can also happen when you are willing to forgive someone who is personally unable to ask you to forgive them for the way they wronged you. They're, they're unable to do it. And an example of this would, would be uh, perhaps at some point many years ago, there was someone who abused you. And, and there's never been any, for, any, any repentance, no reconciliation, nothing at all. And, and that person has now passed away. They are no longer even living. 
And so if you don't get to the place where you are willing to forgive that person, play this out in your mind. This means that you could be held hostage for the rest of your life because you are actually waiting for something that can never even happen. There's some people who have offended you, hurt you, sinned against you. You, You've lost track of them. You don't even know where they are. You don't even know if they live in this state anymore. So here again, what does that mean? That means that that there is no way for there to be any kind of a forgiveness transaction. So that's, that's when we lean into unilateral forgiveness. When Jesus Christ, our Savior, was hanging on the cross, he said... Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's unilateral forgiveness. So let me, let me talk briefly about this other kind of forgiveness. What is, what is transactional forgiveness? You probably can figure it out. This is the forgiveness that happens because a person has come, they have confessed, they have repented of the wrong, and then there is a conversation that happens in the process. In order for transactional forgiveness to happen, well, guess what? It obviously requires two people or two parties, okay? And so when you have this kind of forgiveness, transactional forgiveness, you have an individual who steps up to the plate and says, I'm coming to you now and I am asking you if you would please forgive me. In addition, Man, if we're going to do this God's way, in addition, I would say that that individual will also in that moment genuinely from the heart be demonstrating that they're really sorry. And so when this happens, when this kind of forgiveness happens, you know what else happens? It begins to open up the door for the opportunity of reconciliation to begin. Reconciliation can only occur once this transactional forgiveness conversation takes place. So, man, this is is a lot. And I would just say to you today, man, as you're listening to the Holy Spirit of God prompting you and speaking to you, for some of you in this room, this will be heavy on your heart. Because already, in the first seven minutes of the sermon, the Spirit of Almighty God is reminding you of a person or a situation in your own life. And, and you've got to deal with that. And some of you may be saying right now, Kent, there ain't no way. There, there's no way I can go into that space. But what a blessing it is to share with you God's promises and tell you what makes forgiveness possible. It's when you first recognize that you have been forgiven. That's where it starts. Look again, Colossians 3.13. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also now are to forgive. So if you lose sight of the fact that you are forgiven, I'm just telling you, it's going to be really difficult for you to forgive other people. And forgiveness is that. It's like this beautiful word. Like everybody wants to embrace that. We love it. We like to talk about it. People even outside of the faith community will say, yes, forgiveness is good, forgiveness is important, forgiveness is a beautiful thing. We love the idea of it until we're the ones who have to give it. And I would say that's a, that's a big part of my struggle, probably your struggle as well. Because in asking for forgiveness, it requires me to be willing to lay everything down to take on that posture of surrender. Well, what do I do? Does that kind of remind you of something that happened at the cross? On the cross, we see God sending his own perfect son, Jesus, and God took the initiative to provide forgiveness before we even requested it. I shared this verse last week, Romans 5, 8, but God proves his own love for us In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so you and I were unilaterally forgiven when Jesus went to the cross, and and now he commands us to also forgive. Man, I'd never heard this quote from C.S. Lewis until this week when I was 
uh, doing some research. Look at this. This is so good. To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Oh, my goodness. And so it, it is very, uh, a very real possibility that you come to church this morning and now you're realizing maybe, maybe I am being held hostage. And, and hear me out. The enemy knows that if you hold on to unforgiveness, he knows it is going to consume you. He knows this. And Satan knows that as long as you are consumed and distracted by that, that he can own you and he can control you. And, and he can do that because when you're in that place, all you end up trying to do is, is like manage the hurt and manage the pain and the abuse and all the struggle that you've been through. It's such a distraction. Now, there's even more. You're like, it even goes deeper? Yes, it goes even deeper. This teaching on forgiveness is throughout God's word. I want to show you now how you're going to see it at the end of the Lord's Prayer. How many of you say, man, I know it. I got that one, brother. We all know the Lord's Prayer, right? Well, just to make sure, I'm going to suggest we say it together this morning. Here we go. I'm putting it on the screen. Is it up there? Oh, there it is. Look at that. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You say amen or amen? Amen. It really didn't matter. Now, we know it. Pat yourself on the back. Great job. You probably memorized that as a child. Beautiful prayer. This is what Jesus teaches us. Pray like this. But I wonder if you know, I'll call it the tagline, the very next two verses after the prayer. Jesus continues, and here it is, Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Jesus says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And so, I mean, I don't really have to interpret this, do I? Jesus says to the church, if you want to be forgiven, you must also be a forgiver to others. Now, some of you would say, well, hold on, man. What about when I got saved? What about when I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ like, I, I thought I was forgiven. Wasn't I forgiven then? Well, yes, you were forgiven. Yes. But I want you to take a minute to distinguish between legal forgiveness and relational forgiveness. We, we need to consider both of these truths. When you accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, you were legally forgiven. God declared that you are no longer guilty of sin. But watch this, according to what Jesus himself says, if you refuse to forgive others, the relational side, if you refuse to forgive others, if you reject relational forgiveness, it's as if you are blocking God's operation in your life. And, and at that point, I would say, I don't know that it matters how many prayers you pray, or how many church services you come to, or how many Bible studies you sign up for, if you refuse to forgive horizontally, if you refuse to forgive relationally, it will break down and destroy your relationship with God vertically. We are called to forgive in the same way our Heavenly Father forgives. Many of you remember Jesus in his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is all throughout the New Testament. Now, if you go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, 
Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, that whole chapter is really talking to the church about, man, here's what it looks like to, to live a new life in Jesus Christ. And you, you're rolling through all that text, and then you get all the way down to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And look what the text says there. God's word says there, don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. Uh, do the application. When we refuse to forgive, don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. Why? Because you were sealed by him for the day of redemption. And I, I, don't, want, I don't want us to overlook what is happening here in Ephesians chapter 4. Because this is something supernatural is playing out. Don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You are sealed by Him for the day of redemption. Then if you jump to verse 32, here it is. More one another's. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. And, and so I look at Ephesians chapter 4 as a reminder to all of us. You have crossed over into the supernatural. And it is the Holy Spirit of God now living in you that frees you up to forgive others. Don't, don't sit in church and think, oh yeah, I can do this in my own strength. You can't. But it is by the power of the Spirit of God living in you that you are freed up to live for Christ, to forgive others. And so you go back. I don't know everybody's journey in this room, but I know many of your stories. And for some of you, like if you go back all the way to when you were a kid, and some bad stuff that may have happened in your life. And there has been hurt, and there has been heartache, and there has been pain, and you're holding on to that. And the truth is you're being held hostage. But it is in Jesus Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit living in you, that you find freedom. Most of you uh, in church know the story of Joseph what an incredible story. And if you go back and, and look at his story in the book of Genesis, uh, it's an unbelievable story that will bring some clarity to what we're talking about today. You know, you know what happened? Here's young Joseph, and he is completely abandoned by his brothers. Then they decide, we're going to just sell him off into slavery. And, and all these all these different things play out. But then if you like fast forward 20 years from, from that, Joseph ends up finding incredible favor with Pharaoh. And he's basically put in charge of everything. It's an unbelievable story. And so now two decades later, here come Joseph's brothers. They, they really have no idea what has happened to him. Honestly, I don't even know if they, they knew if he was alive or not. But, but Jacob, Joseph's father, Jacob says, hey, boys, there, there's no food in the land. And his father says, I want, I want you guys to make the journey to Egypt. I've heard that there's some grain in Egypt. I want you to go there so that, that we might, as a family, have food in the middle of this drought. And so think about this. Here go the brothers. They start making the road trip, not knowing that their brother Joseph is now in authority in Egypt. And so here we are. His very own brothers who had betrayed him over 20 years prior enter into the presence of Joseph requesting that they might purchase some grain. And Joseph says the most amazing four words to his brothers in Genesis chapter 45. And I would say to you, church, this is where everything changes. Joseph says to them, come near to me. Come near to me. They, they didn't even recognize him. And Joseph said to his brothers, hey, it's me. Your little brother, the one you sold into Egypt. He says, come near to me. And he communicates to them, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I, I'm not going to speak on your behalf. But if my brothers had done to me what his brothers did to him, 
And I found myself in that moment, I feel like instead of saying, come near to me, instead of saying it's going to be okay, I probably would have said these four words, I'm going to get you. I'm guessing you might have said something similar. <laughs> because most of us, I think, would have said, I didn't forget what you did to me. But instead, Joseph says, come on, come near to me. And he says to his brothers, God sent me ahead of you. So that he might use me to preserve your very own lives. He says, God has orchestrated all of this. And now, I want you to go back and tell our father that I am alive and that I am well. You think about what Joseph didn't say in that moment. He didn't say to them, you good for nothing losers. He did not say... You now are going to have to go back to dad and tell him all the junk you did to me. He didn't say that. Instead, he protected his own brother's reputation with their father, even when he had every opportunity to get even with them. My goodness. So how how is Joseph able to do that? And I simply want to point you to the very last chapter in the book of Genesis to show you what he said to his brothers. This is Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. He said, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And so church, I just want you to see the truth of this. You will never know how God can take a wrong that was committed against you and turn it to good until forgiveness has occurred. Many years ago, um, a lot of you are familiar with a, a lady named Corey Ten Boom, and her testimony is phenomenal. And uh, she told a story years ago about a season of her life when she was really struggling to forget about a wrong that had been done against her. And uh, her testimony is, she said, you know, I, I, I forgave the person, but she said, I just kept rehashing the incident over and over and over again in my mind. She said, I could not even sleep at night. And some of you can relate to that. Her testimony is this. She said, finally, I cried out to God for help, in in putting this problem to rest. (laughs) And she writes, God's help came in the form of a kind Lutheran pastor. She says, to whom I confessed. I confessed to him all my failures, all my struggles after these two weeks of sleepless nights. Here's what the Lutheran pastor told Corey Ten Boom. He said to her as they were talking together and looking out a window, he said, up there, right over there in the church tower, he he nodded and looked out the window, he said, "Is, is a big bell, which is rung by pulling on the rope. And this pastor said to her, but do you know what? After the bell ringer lets go of the rope, that bell continues to swing for a while. Gong, gong. I've really been looking forward to this part of the sermon. Yeah. <laughs> gong. Slower and slower, the gongs continue, he said, until there's a final gong and it stops. And he said to her, I believe the same thing is true of forgiveness. When we forgive, we take our hands off the rope. 
But if we've been holding on to our grievances for a long time, we should not be surprised if the old angry thoughts keep coming up for a while. They're just the gongs of the old bell slowing down. And Corey Ten Boom said in that moment, it proved to be. She says, there were a few more midnight reverberations, a couple of gongs when that subject came up in my conversations, but the force, which was my willingness in this matter, had gone out of them. They came less and less often and at last stopped altogether. I would say to all of you, forgiveness. It, it is so clear what Jesus teaches. For some of us, we need to be forgiven. For some of us, we need to offer forgiveness. For some of us, we have been holding on to that rope for a long time. And today, you are invited to let go to lay it down, to release it, and to walk away. When we, a few weeks ago, had our three nights of prayer and fasting as we came together as a church, uh, we opened up the altar each night for people to come and to kneel and to pray. And uh, I feel like, especially with today's message, it's most appropriate to invite you to do that again. And we'll do that like we have these past couple of weeks. If, if your heart's desire is just to come and to be alone, and you, it's just you and God, I'm inviting you to come to this side of the altar to kneel and pray. You could come over here as an individual. You could come with a spouse. You could come as a family, with a friend. doesn't matter. But we're just going to let you be with the Lord. If today, man, God is... God is revealing to you next steps in this journey, and you're like, man, I, I definitely want to pray at the altar, but I'm, I'm asking somebody to come to pray over me. I'm going to invite you to come to this side of the altar, and if we see you here kneeling, someone, we, we will walk up to you and, and lay a hand on you and pray over you. And that will be your step towards responding to what God is calling you to this day. May we be a church that not only understands what the Bible says about forgiveness, but the church that puts it into practice, that lives it out for God's glory. Let's pray. God, thank you for your truth. Thank you for the clarity that you've given us in Scripture related to forgiveness. And so, Lord, I absolutely know there are precious people, even in this room right now, uh, who have been holding on to some things for a really long time. God, we are not denying their pain and their hurt. That is real. And so what we're doing today is resting in and abiding in your promises that through the power of the Holy Spirit, there is freedom to be found. So God, change us. Allow us to step into being the one who offers forgiveness and the one who receives it for your kingdom's glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're gonna stand.